الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So brothers and sisters, we continue with the chapter related to حب في الله. Actually, we completed that chapter and we have a new chapter before us. التحذير من إذاء الصالحين والضعفة والمساكين. The translation is the warning related to harming or inconveniencing the pious, as salihin the pious, the righteous, wal-da'afa, and also those weak in the community, wal-masakeen, and those who are destitute, who are poor in society. So obviously there has to be a link be between this chapter and the previous chapters. In the previous chapters, we looked at the hub fillah and lillah, the hub, the love that we are to have, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and loving others and to be in their company, uh, to associate ourselves with these type of people. And if we love someone for this cause, to express it so that it strengthens the bonds and in turn it strengthens the community. So this chapter, as it was translated, the warning regarding harming or inconveniencing those who are righteous or those who are weak and uh, vulnerable in society, the link that some of these scholars or the ulama point out is that if we uh, see people who have qualities, we are to associate with them. And if we don't associate with them, then we are depriving ourselves. We, th we should not fall into the category of harming these people or harming the weak or the vulnerable in society. For indeed, by harming someone who's unable to defend themselves, or someone who may not bother, you know, they're, they're just busy with their own things, they're not uh, uh, being a nuisance or uh, harmful to anyone or causing any form of injustice, then uh, this person may not want to involve himself in things that are baseless or useless. So therefore, uh, it's best to avoid uh, harming these type of people or causing trouble to these kind of people. So, uh, as is the habit of Imam Nawi rahmatullah, he begins by a few verses. So here before us in this chapter is the verse of the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Ahzab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بِغَيْرِ مَكْتَسَبُوا فَقَدِ احْتَمَلُوا بُهْتَانًا وَإِثْمًا مُبِينًا The translation, those who inconvenience the believing men and believing women, بِغَيْرِ مَكْتَسَبُوا in relation to things that are not of, of cause or worthy. Indeed, they have taken upon themselves a slander mubina, and an open or a plain sin. Now these are the verses of Surah Al-Ahzab as pointed out. And if we look into the tafsir of the, or the Sha'nul Wurud, why these verses were revealed, what was the context to them, we find that the Mufassirun write about various incidents. One particular incident that is agreed upon majority of the Mufassirun is that in Madinatul Munawwara, uh, before the regulations of hijab or modesty and proper dressing were revealed, many amongst the hypocrites, many amongst those who were sinful, they would inconvenience the women folk by taunting at them, by uh, assaulting them, by harming them in many ways that were common amongst the jahiliyyah, amongst the, those who were ignorant. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said that there's no differentiation between those women who are regarded as evil and corrupt in society who like this type of uh, appeal or or attraction towards those who are arrogant and proud and they engage in fornication, adultery. And when it comes to the believing women, there's no distinction. They don't make a differentiation. They also bother and inconvenience the, the believing women and they have to go out of their way. They have to go through struggles and sacrifice to protect themselves from this type of immorality or indecency. So why is it that you do not command the believing women or the believing men to dress in a specific way and the Prophet ﷺ, he said, look, I don't make the deen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals it. So therefore, until I don't receive any revelation, I can't make any changes. 
So after a few days, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses of Surah Al-Ahzab where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pointed out the method of dressing for both men and women to lower their gazes, to have a just society, to have a moral society uh, based on good character, good morals, and the, the rulings regarding uh, uh, you know, gender relationships, etc. One of the profound surahs that deals with this matter is Surah Al-Ahzab of the Holy Quran and also Surah Al-Nur. So amongst those verses that were revealed, this is one of those verses that, that were revealed in sequence of those verses or in collaboration with those verses. So now keeping this mind in context, we translate the verse and we'll have a better idea of what was going on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ Those who inconvenience, harm or assault, يُؤْذُونَ comes from إِذَا which means to harm, to cause inconvenience. Those who harm or cause inconvenience to both believing men and believing women. بِغَيْرِ مَكْتَسَبُوا and you know they have no cause in the matter they're not uh, they're not appealed towards this kind of immorality or sin whoever does this they have taken upon themselves a slander they're they're accusing these pure chaste uh, uh, women and and the believers uh, with these type of slanderous in, uh, inappropriate actions or sin and hence they are taking a burden upon themselves and those who do this, they have definitely take upon a plain or clear sin. The next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about uh, the orphan. And because in the chapter, Imam Nawi rahmatullah alayhi has pointed out that it's also inappropriate to harm not only the pious or the righteous, but also those who are unable to defend or protect themselves. Uh, for example, the weak among society, the poor, etc. فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرْ سُورَةُ الدُّحَى وَالدُّحَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى Allah says here, فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرْ As for the orphan, do not oppress. وَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرْ And as for the one who is begging, a beggar, a pauper, فَلَا تَنْهَرْ Do not repulse this, this beggar. Do not cause inconvenience or uh, uh, such a situation that it would cause harm uh, to that beggar. So we see it's common even in this time and age that uh, sometimes panhandlers or uh, people who are poor, etc., you know, they, 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 they are asking for their needs uh, and uh, we don't want to give them. So if we don't want to give them, we should remain silent. We shouldn't say inappropriate words. We shouldn't inconvenience them. We shouldn't cause trouble for them because the Prophet ﷺ in one narration also points out that a person who is oppressed, there is, there is no veil between Allah and this person who is oppressed. فَإِنَّ الْمَظْلُومِ For indeed the one who is oppressed or wronged, when they make dua, there is no veil between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this person. He may be in a genuine need, we may not understand it. So the best thing is obviously to give. If we're unable to give, then in the least we should not cause any inconvenience to this person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, as for the orphan, do not oppress, and as for the beggar, do not repulse. Now, uh, Imam Nawi rahmatullah in this chapter says, أَمَّا الْأَحَادِيثِ فَكَثِيرَ If we are to bring about a hadith regarding this chapter and this title, there are numerous ahadith, kathira, many ahadith. And he points out a few and he just gives, gives an indication because some of these hadith have been quoted already in the previous chapters. So he says, مِنْهَا حَدِيثُ أَبِي هريرة. He says, I refer to also the hadith of Abu Huraira that has already surpassed and uh, it was... Regarding when the Prophet ﷺ said, Man aada li waliyan. As for the person who causes in, inconvenience to any righteous person, any wali, any righteous person, a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, faqad adhantuhu bil harb. Indeed, I declare against that person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I declare against that person war. So uh, he's referring to this hadith. It also testifies to this fact that we're not supposed to wrong or cause inconvenience to those who are righteous or pious. وَمِنْهَا حَدِيثُ Sa'd. He says also we can refer to the hadith of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu which came in one of the previous chapters. And uh, in that narration, it was mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ, يَا أَبَا بَكْرَ O Abu Bakr, لَإِن كُنْتَ أَغْضَبْتَهُمْ لَقَدْ أَغْضَبْتَ رَبَّكَ If you have caused inconvenience, if you have caused anger, to these people, meaning the people who were on the right path, 
لَقَدْ أَغْضَبْتَ ربك. You have caused inconvenience, meaning you have angered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your Lord also. So, uh, many narrations, the Prophet ﷺ also speaks about how whoever obeys the Prophet has indeed obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever has gone against the Prophet ﷺ has also gone against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, there are narrations that point out whoever caused inconvenience to the Prophet ﷺ, to believing men and women, etc. They have, uh, you know, uh, crossed the limits and angered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's referring to all of these narrations. Jundub ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, another narration. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, Man salla salat subh The person who performs salat subh Fajr salah. Now, majority of the scholars say this refers to salah with jama'ah. Salah in congregation. But others, there is an opinion that this refers to simply performing the Fajr Salah. Man salla salat subh The person who offers the Fajr prayer, the morning prayer, فَهُوَ فِي ذِمَّةِ اللَّهِ They are in the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dhimma refers to a refuge, protection. They are in the refuge or the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the Prophet ﷺ declared by saying, فَلَا يَطْلُبَنَّكُمُ اللَّهُ مِن ذِمَّتِهِ بِشَيْءٍ None of you should be in a position where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala questions you regarding this protection in any way. Now there are various interpretations or meanings as to what this exactly means. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, gives protection to the person who performs the Fajr prayer. Now the Prophet ﷺ is saying that none of you, meaning in general, none of you should try and harm this person who has performed the Fajr prayer. Why? Because they are in the direct protection of Allah. And when you're, when you're challenging Allah, then obviously you're taking yourself towards harm. You're taking yourself towards, uh, you know, falling short. So the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever performs the Fajr prayer, they're in the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And none of you should be asked about this protection. And another opinion amongst the muhaddithun is that it is possible to harm this person who has performed Fajr prayer. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not send immediate protection for that believer, but they are still in the dhimma of Allah, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has announced that whoever has performed their Fajr prayer, then they are blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In one narration we read in one of the chapters that when a person wakes up in the morning and they do three things, they are protected from shaitan, from laziness, uh, and, and from being unproductive throughout the day. The Prophet ﷺ says that there are three knots, and uh, you know, these knots are untied when, when a person wakes up, they wake up with the remembrance of Allah by reciting a dua, by remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making some form of dhikr. And then the second is that they wash themselves for prayer. They wash themselves in preparation of the prayer. And the third thing is to actually perform the prayer. So the Prophet ﷺ says, فَأَصْبَحَ نَشِيطَ That this person begins the day in an active way, in a productive way, and Allah's blessings is with this person. So yes, there will be challenges. It's not to say that a person who performs Fajr, there's no problems. There will be problems, there will be challenges, difficulties, but they will be able to pass it in, in, a, in a way that is acceptable within the limits of the Sharia and the, and the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. And at the same time, whoever causes any form of inconvenience on the Day of Judgment, Allah will ask that person that this person was in my blessing. This person was under my special glance because of performing the Fajr prayer and you inconvenienced this person. You caused trouble to this person. So this is another interpretation about this part of the hadith. And uh, others also point out that فَلَا يَطْلُبَنَّكُمُ اللَّهُ مِن ذِمَّتِهِ بِشَيْءٍ That a person should be very careful about performing the Fajr prayer because Allah is announcing this special protection. So, the meaning according to one group of scholars, it's not about another person, it's about oneself. That we should be careful. If Allah is announcing that He will bless the person who performs Fajr prayer with protection, with goodness, then why should we not move forward to perform the Fajr prayer? Why shouldn't we make arrangements to wake up early to perform the Fajr prayer? And a brother asked me a very good question the other day. We were at a, uh, you know, a, a, a reception and it was getting quite late and the food hadn't come yet. He says, you know, these kind of things, you know, when it's so late, and especially when Fajr is uh, really early in the morning, in summer, and Isha is late, 
and, and we overeat and we eat late, then we get lazy and we tend to fall asleep without performing Isha prayer. And then we've eaten so much and we become so engrossed in our deep sleep because we slept late that we also miss the Fajr prayer. So it's very easy in the summer to miss both the Fajr and the Isha prayer because Isha is late and the Fajr is early. So here, according to one group of the Muhaddithun, فَلَا يَطْلُبَنَّكُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ ذِمَّتِهِ بِشَيْءٍ None of you should be in a position where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to question you about this protection, meaning that you shouldn't forsake or you shouldn't let go of these prayers. For indeed Allah has given you protection, but you're not taking that protection. Allah has given you the blessings, but we're not taking the advantage of being in this blessing. So let it not be that Allah question us on the Day of Judgment because of our own mishaps and doings. فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يَطْلُبَهُ مِنْ ذِمَّتِهِ The Prophet ﷺ continues and says, For indeed whoever is questioned about this specific protection in any way, shape or form, يُدْرِكُهُ ثُمَّ يَكُبُّهُ عَلَى وَجْهِهِ فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمِ It's possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take the person to task and this will cause this individual who has forsaken this responsibility or challenged this dhimma, this protection, to be thrown into the hellfire. Finari Jahannam to be thrown into the hellfire. So we seek protection from this type of situation. May Allah protect one and all. So this was a short chapter. We'll begin the next chapter, read a few hadith and conclude the session. So the next chapter, 49, Babu Ijra'i Ahkamin Nasi ala Zahir. The chapter related to making judgments regarding other people based on what is apparent. Zahir, what is apparent. And leaving their internal secrets with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now obviously again the same question is what is the link between this chapter and the previous chapters because Imam Nawi rahmatullah alayhi, uh, has, has listed his chapters in specific sequence. So here he's saying that this chapter I'm bringing about narrations and verses where we can understand this important message from the Prophet ﷺ, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when we make judgments about others, we should just make it on their apparent. We should not make it on things that we have no access to. So for example, you know, we see a person, we've only seen them for the first time, we start, you know, making assumptions. Oh, this person is like this, or this person is like that. Oh, you know, this person is doing this. We don't have any evidence. We don't know what their intentions are. We don't know what their internal matters are. And we're making these type of judgments. So this is inappropriate in Islam. The instruction is whatever we see as evident and before our eyes, we make a judgment between that, in, in apparent to that. And in fact, in one narration, the Prophet ﷺ in Musnad Ahmad, the Prophet ﷺ says, even if you see your Muslim believer, brother or sister doing something that seems to be inappropriate, seems to be wrong, think about 70 excuses before you actually make the judgment that this person is doing something wrong. So we should actually... Uh, uh, you know, be clean in our hearts regarding other, other people. They say when you point a finger at someone else, there are three pointing at yourself. So we should first question ourselves before we make judgments about others. So, Ijra'u Ahkamin Nas. This is the chapter regarding making judgments about people al-zahir, on their apparent situations and leaving their secrets, their internal affairs with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qala Allah ta'ala, the verse that Imam Nawi begins with, is the verses of Surah At-Tawbah, verse number 5. In Surah Bara'a, Surah Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about those people who made treaties with the Prophet So, if we study the Surah, it's talk, it begins with this whole chapter or, or discussion about the various tribes that had made agreements and treaties with the Prophet Not once, not twice, numerous times. And these people, each time they broke those treaties, now at the occasion of Hudaybiyah, at the occasion of uh, when the Prophet ﷺ made the treaty with the Quraysh and some of the tribes that were in alliance with the Quraysh, they also agreed to some of these terms. And some of these tribes, they, were, they had already previously made agreements with the Prophet ﷺ. As I pointed out, they had breached these agreements. They had gone against these agreements. Now, at the occasion of the Hudaybiyah or at the occasion near to the victory of Mecca, some of these tribes, they came and they said, you know, we want to become Muslim. So some of the companions, they said, how can, they said, oh Prophet of Allah, how can we trust these people? 
They broke their treaties more than seven times, more than four times, more than five times. And you want to accept them as believers and treat them the same way as those who participated in Badr, in Uhad, in Ahzab. How can this be possible? So the Prophet ﷺ said, this is what we have been instructed and Allah revealed the verses, this verse here, فَإِن تَابُوا If they repent, وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةِ And they establish the prayer, وَآتَوُوا الزَّكَاةِ And they give, they discharge the zakah, فَخَلُّوا سَبِيلَهُمْ Then leave their matter with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this was about those people who had caused deception, they were ready to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. It was a tension, it was a situation with a lot of tension where uh, you know, the Prophet ﷺ had matters with them and it, most of the time were negative. So this is why the, the, the companions, they, they felt uneasy. But this verse made it very clear that if they're coming forward and they're, they're saying we have repented, we're going to be peaceful, we're not going to do these type of things anymore. And from their apparent actions, they're performing salah, they're giving zakah, you know, they're doing the, the, the main tenets of what any Muslim would do. فَخَلُّوا سَبِيلَهُمْ Then don't question their secret matters. That is with Allah, leave it up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this chapter, Imam Nawi has listed a few narrations. Uh, we'll just uh, translate two and then inshallah we'll conclude the session. So the first narration is on the strength of Ibn Umar radiallahu an, who is uh, obviously Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, whose son. He says that the Prophet ﷺ once declared, and again, you know, these type of hadith, we got to understand the context. Uh, when, a, you know, when a person who's obviously negative about Islam and hears this type of hadith, he'll come up with the most negative image. So I'm going to translate and I'm going to give you the context. The Prophet ﷺ declared, Umirtu an uqatilan nas. I have been commanded to fight people, to confront people. Hatta yashhadu until they testify to the fact that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah's messenger. Wa yuqimu salah and until they do not establish the prayer. Wa yu'tu zakah and until they do not uh, discharge the zakah. Fa idha fa'alu dhalika asamu minni dima'ahum. When they do this, then their lives and their wealth are in the protection on my behalf. إِلَّا بِحَقِّ الْإِسْلَامِ Unless it is justified through a regulation of Islam. وَحِسَابُهُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى And their internal affairs or their accounts are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So obviously from this narration it seems that the Prophet's mission was to basically fight people until they accept Islam. Apparently this is what we understand. Average Muslim would also understand this. But again there's a context to this. Read the context of this hadith. This hadith was said by the Prophet ﷺ when all the surrounding tribes of Mecca and Medina had declared that we want to assassinate and kill the Prophet ﷺ. We want to hurt every Muslim that is there present. For example, at the occasion of Ahzab, the Quraysh mustered all the surrounding tribes of the vicinity to kill every living Muslim. So the Prophet ﷺ, in that situation of warfare, he said, look, the only people that have declared their peace with us is those who are the Ahlul Kitab in Madinatul Munawwara, the idolaters who are in Madinatul Munawwara, the Jews who are in Madinatul Munawwara, the atheists who are in Medina. They had declared their peace. So the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, they're peaceful to us, we're going to be peaceful with them. But all those other tribes, they are coming to kill us. They're coming to destroy our lands, to destroy and, and take the lives of our women and children. So in this context, the Prophet ﷺ said, look, I have been sent with this mission of self-defense and the message of La ilaha illallah. So in this context, the Prophet ﷺ said, in no way does this mean the Prophet ﷺ was sent to kill every disbeliever. If that was the case, why did the Prophet ﷺ make agreements with the Jews, with the Christians, with the idolaters of peace? in Madinatul Munawwara. This was not the case. His action is very clear. The Quranic verses are very clear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in tabarruhum wa tukhsitu ilayhim that if they are good to you, they are peaceful to you, they, are, they show elements of goodness and cooperation, then the Prophet ﷺ is being told, the believers are being told that you are also to show that fairness and that justness with them. It's only those they take you out of your land, they expel you out of your lands, 
and they take away your wealth, they kill your people, it is though against those people that you would stand up for justice and for peace. So in this context, this was said. And obviously, why is this hadith being mentioned in this chapter? It's because the Prophet ﷺ said, وَحِسَابُهُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى That if they are performing salah, they are doing actions of peace, then you know we leave their internal matters with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't say, no, he has some conspiracy. One new Muslim, one revert told me, you know, I don't like going to some of these masjids. So I said, why? So he said, you know, I hear people chatting. They say, you know, he, he's probably a spy for the RCMP. He's pro probably from CSIS. No, وَحِسَابُهُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ He said he has accepted Islam. He's joining you in the prayer. Okay, you leave it up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do you have to hide? Okay, even if he is a CSIS agent, what do you got to hide? So, uh, you know, we leave these things up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, there's a narration that's coming up, but I don't want it. It's, it's getting late. So, uh, basically, in one of these narrations, the Prophet ﷺ called the, one of the companions who, in warfare, it was warfare. This was a person who was trying to attack this companion. But when the upper hand was with the believer, as he was about to defend himself, he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. He said, I testify that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah. And he said, you're only saying this to protect your life. And he executed him. So the case came before the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ called him and said, did you actually do this? He said, yes. He said, he was only do it to saving, save his life. So the Prophet ﷺ said, what will you do on the day of judgment if this person comes with La ilaha illallah in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the companion said, Istaghfir li, O Prophet of Allah, make istighfar for me. Seek forgiveness on my behalf because I've made a blunder here, I've made a mistake. So the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't say anything. He, he kept on repeating, What will you do if he brings La ilaha illallah on the day of judgment? And according to one narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, Halla shaqaqta qalbi, did you tear open his heart? to see whether his Islam was genuine or not. So basically, we don't make judgments on, 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 on internal matters. That's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We, we act on what is zahir, what is apparent, and, and, and what seems to be in front of us. And inshallah, leave, leave the rest up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we fear anything, Allah is with us. Allah is, is, His mercy is with those who are on truth, who are on justice, who are on goodness. We make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to protect us from all these type of negative situations. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clean our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and steadfastness on the deen and on the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiyul alim wa tub alina ya mawlana innaka anta tawabur rahim wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khayri khalqihi Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Bi rahmatihi.